Praise the Lord. Well, where are we and where are we going? I remember a few years ago when I was pastor of this church, this one brother kept asking me, where are we going? Where are we going? Where are we going as a church? I said, we're not going anywhere. We're going to stay right here on the street corner and preach the gospel. Is that good? Praise the Lord. Open your Bible to 2 Peter. Hope you got a lesson plan there, an outline. And uh, you follow along and see where we are going. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. 2 Peter chapter 3. If you get there, say amen. amen. Okay. And the rest of you just catch up quick. That's page 1584 if you have a really cool Bible. Okay, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 1. Beloved, now I write to you this second epistle, in both of which I stir up your pure mind by way of reminder. Sometimes we need to be reminded of things. That you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. Knowing this first, verse 3, know this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lust, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, since the last generation died, they were saying he was coming, and he didn't come in their generation, he didn't come in this generation. For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they willingly forget. The King James Bible, I like what it says, they are willingly ignorant. They willfully forget that by the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. But the heavens and the earth which are now preserved by the same word are reserved for fire unto the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Lord, we thank you for your word this morning. We pray it, it, it comes alive, it's living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. And Father, I pray that your word becomes that, that spiritual uh, indelible ink marker that writes something on our spirits today. In Jesus' name, we thank you. Amen. So... I'm going to talk to you today about uh, situational awareness. Anybody ever heard that phrase before? Yeah, um, there's, uh, if you've been in the military, especially in the, in the boots on the ground, ground pounder, uh, combat people, you understand situational awareness. That's uh, being aware of one's surroundings and any potential hazards or threats. Today, in the, today's world, you have to have situational awareness to go check your mail. Literally. I mean, when's the best time to carjack somebody? When they fill up their gas tank so you don't run out. People get ambushed at gas stations all the time. You have to have situational awareness. A person who practices situational awareness recognizes the possibility of being attacked, harmed, or put in a dangerous situation and is prepared to act to protect themselves. Situational awareness can be summed up as the understanding of an environment, understanding your environment, what's going on around you, the elements that are in that environment, and how it changes with respect to time and other factors. Your situational awareness, when, you, when you're paying attention to what's going on around you, you understand that things can change quickly. It can go from good to bad. It can go from bad to good. It can just go from here to different. But things can change rather rapidly. Situational awareness is important for effective decision-making in many environments. Okay? So where are we? Where's our situational awareness? As we look at our environment, where, where are we? What's the state of our, our environment? Well, the state of our environment is, if, if you're a Bible person, if you have a biblical worldview, this is the last days. It's not the last days of the planet. When people talk about the, world, the world's going to end you know, in 12 years or 6 years or whatever, the world is not going to end. If you have a biblical worldview, you understand that 
we are in the church age, the dispensation of grace. Christ died on the cross. The, 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 the nation of Israel was living under the Mosaic law from Mount Sinai all the way until Jesus died on the cross. And when he rose from the dead and poured out his Holy Spirit, this became the dispensation of grace. He said, I'm going to build my church. That was a foreign concept. The Jews didn't think that included all of us uh, heathens, non-Jewish people. They, they thought it was strictly for the Jews, that all the promises of God. But then Jesus came, and he brought a new thing. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Whosoever, Jew or Gentile, Greek, Parthians, all of them, anybody who calls on the name of the Lord can be saved. So we're in the dispensation of grace. A dispensation is defined as the law of the house. How God chooses, God chooses, not us. I know some people that make up their own dispensations. They make up their own law of the house. But a dispensation is a period of time in which God chooses to deal with the human race under a certain set of guidelines or rules. And he's the one who sets those boundaries and those rules, not us. And this is the dispensation of grace, where the blood of Christ is offered to all humanity for the forgiveness of sin and the hope of eternal life. But we're at the end of that. We're, it's getting close to the end of that. Now, what's going to happen after that? If you have a biblical worldview, and you can find it on that chart over there in our Bible college class area, there's a chart on top of the wall. It starts with eternity past in the book of Genesis, and it goes all the way through to the end of the book of Revelation to Christ's eternal kingdom. But what's going to happen on this earth is at the end of the dispensation of grace, the next event on God's prophetic calendar is the catching away of the church, the rapture of the church. I know ministers. I personally have friends, minister friends, who grew up in church and embraced the teachings of the scripture about the rapture, and now they don't believe in a rapture. So not everybody who embraces the Bible or what they call their biblical worldview even believes that there's going to be a catching away. But it's, it's there. It's, it's, it's what's going to happen. As born-again Christians, we're supposed to be looking for and expecting the rapture of the church. Well, the rapture is not even in the Bible. True enough. That word, the word rapture, is not in the Bible. Okay? Okay. The way that comes around is the rapture in, in the New Testament was the original language of the New Testament was Greek. And it's been translated into a lot of other things throughout the generations. In Greek, when the Bible says that we will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air, that word is harpezo. The Greek word is harpezo. It means to snatch violently, to take in John chapter 10, when it says the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent take it by force, the word by force is harpezo. They take it by force. They snatch it. In, in Acts chapter 8, when um, Philip had preached at Samaria and had a great revival, and then he, the Lord said, go to this other city. And as he was on the way, he sees the Ethiopian guy in the... Uh, chariot. He, he witnesses Christ to him. The guy receives Christ for salvation. He says, hey, I want to get baptized. There's a, there's a pool of water. Baptize me right there. So they get out of the chariot. Philip baptizes the guy. And the Bible says when he brings him out of the water that Philip is gone. The Lord caught him away to a city called Azotus, which was 32 miles away. It says instantly he was there. When it says the Lord caught him away, the Greek word is harpezo. Okay? So when people say, well, the word rapture is not even in the Bible, I tell them, okay, I'm going to be harpezo. <laughs> Figure that one out. Now, before the scriptures were translated into English, they were, also, they were translated into Latin. In fact, the, the strict Catholic uh, Church, I believe, used the Latin Bible. The ministry people, the bishops and, and priests, used a lot of the Latin Bible. Well, 
In the Latin Bible, the word is rapir. And it means the same, same definition as harpazo, to snatch. And so when you take rapir and put it into English, it, it's rapture. So that's where we get the word rapture. So from now on, I'm just calling it the rapture. That's how I am. You can call it whatever you want. You can even say it doesn't happen, but it does. The rapture is biblical. Now I'm going to go through some, I got these, uh, I put these Bible verses in here in, in order so that if you're good at thumbing through your Bible, you can uh, follow along. But we're going to go to Philippians chapter 3 first. And then we're going to be in uh, 1 Thessalonians. And then we're going to maybe backtrack to 1 Corinthians. Or actually, I'll save that one maybe till the next uh, section. But in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 20, it says, For our citizenship is in heaven. We're not even citizens of this earth. We're just passing through. You know, I, I live in California, so I have a California driver's license, and my ID is California and all that. So I'm a citizen of California, but... A couple years ago, my wife and I took a trip, and we visited 26 states. And we weren't citizens of any of those states. We were just passing through. We're not citizens of this world. If you're born again, our citizenship is in heaven. Amen? All right. The Bible teaches we're in the world, but we're not of the world. Okay? So our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're born again, that's our hope. We're waiting for our Savior who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body. That there's going to come a change. The Bible says flesh and blood cannot inherit eternal life. This body has to either be dissolved or changed. Amen? 1 Thessalonians, a couple pages to the right in your Bible. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10 says, And to wait, Paul's exhorting these people, and he says, We're going to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. So the biblical worldview is that when God wraps up the church age, the dispensation of grace, and takes the church out, it unleashes something called the Great Tribulation or Daniel's 70th week. You can look any of those uh, terms up. Uh, at, they're in the Bible. You can, you can find a lot of information online. But when the, when the rapture takes place and the church is gone, then God's wrath is going to be unleashed on this planet. And when you read the book of Revelation, the first time I read it, it's a good thing I was already saved because it would have scared the hell out of me. But I got saved, and it got out of me before that, when I got saved. So that, he's going to transform us. Go to chapter 4. The rapture is biblical. There's people you can find. I, I, would, I would encourage you to stay away from, from Internet online preachers, unless you're watching New Life 530. Okay, then you're going to hear some good teaching. So, and by the way, our New Life 530 on YouTube is not for the masses out there. We're not trying to get, you know, 100,000 subscribers. We're not trying to get our silver or gold button or whatever you get. Uh, we're not trying to get monetized so we can bring in money. This is for people who don't make it to church on Sunday sometimes. And if you weren't here last Sunday, you need to go watch New Life 530 from last Sunday. The message is called Our Heritage. And, and if you're part of New Life, you need to know about our heritage, okay? So that's enough plug for that. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. Paul had, when he visited them, he had, he had given them the whole counsel of God. He delivered to them everything from Genesis to Revelation, the plan of God. And he talked about the rapture, the coming of Jesus. And so some people communicated back to him. They were concerned about their relatives who had died before Jesus came back. Are they going to miss heaven? 
Are they, are they going to, what's going to happen to them? So he, he's writing to comfort them about that. I don't want you to be ignorant concerning those who have fallen asleep. Talking about people who have died. Lest you sorrow. We sorrow, but not like people with no hope. If we, now this is important. Verse 14. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, you should, if you have something to write with, circle we in your Bible. Even so, God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we, you need to circle that one again, we, Paul is including himself, he's putting himself in, in that uh, basket of people. That we who are alive and remain to the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. So this is how it's going to happen. And when he says we, including himself, he, he saw the big picture when God caught him up to heaven, but he probably didn't have a time stamp. You know, when you're, when you're watching security footage or somewhere, you know, they, or you're, you film something with your camera, and there's a little time stamp, a little running clock down there in the corner. Paul, I don't think he saw the time stamp. I think he saw the big picture, but I don't think he saw time stamps. He knew that when Jesus was going to die on the cross, he was going to open the way of salvation to all humanity through the blood of Jesus, and that when that dispensation came to a close, we're out of here. And then the next dispensation, which is the great tribulation, is going to start. So he says, here's how it's going to happen. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and the trumpet of God. So there's going to be a trumpet and a shout, right? You've got to store that in here for a few minutes. And what happens when the trumpet and the shout happens, that the dead in Christ will rise first. Sometimes when I'm doing a graveside service out at the cemetery, and I remind people that all these headstones are facing east. There's no magic in that, but it comes from the biblical uh, phrase where Jesus said, as sure as the lightning shines out of the eastern, flashes out of the eastern sky, so shall be the coming of the Son of Man. And so, uh, in the, wherever there's a Christian influence in the world, and they bury people, they bury, they bury them, so if they magically sat up in their grave, they would be looking east. It's, it's, you, you go look at, notice next time you go to a cemetery, all those headstones are facing east. Okay? Because they're expecting a resurrection. They're expecting a, a trumpet and a shout. And when the dead in Christ rise first, verse 17 says, then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together, caught up, harpezo, raptured, caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. So how do we comfort one another? He says, comfort one another with those words. If someone needs comforting, as a Christian, these are the words that you comfort each other with. That Jesus is coming. He's coming. They say he isn't. They try to discredit that, and scoffers come and say, oh, it's, everything's always been going on like this. Been saying that for generations. It's not happened. It's going to happen. Jesus said an hour that you think not. He's going to catch some people unawares. Now, notice verse 5. Or excuse me, chapter 5. But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as a labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. The people that are left here after the rapture will not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, though that this day would overtake you as a thief. You are the all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night, we're not of the darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do. And he's not talking about, you know, going home after church and eating a big meal and then stretching out and taking a nap. He's not talking about that. He's talking about spiritual slumber, being awake but asleep to the things of God. Do not let us sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. 
For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet the hope of salvation. And then verse 9. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation. And that word salvation literally means deliverance through our Lord Jesus Christ. When God unleashes his wrath on this planet, you know, if the church was going to go through the tribulation, it would be like spousal abuse right before the wedding. God's not going to beat up his bride right before he brings us to the wedding table. You know what I'm saying? That just doesn't make any sense. He, he loves his bride. He's nurturing his bride. And he's going to come and get us before this tribulation time comes on the whole earth. In Revelation chapter 3, verse 10, he's in the letters to the seven churches, he says to this church, he says, if you keep my commandments and do what I tell you, I'm going to keep you from the hour of trial that's going to try the whole earth. In other words, I'm, you're getting out of here before this tribulation starts. But if you back up a couple of churches, the letter to one of the churches was a corrupt church. And the word of the Lord to that corrupt church was, if you don't get this thing straightened out, I'm going to cast you into great tribulation. Okay? So, the rapture is biblical. There it is, right there in the Bible. And there's, there's a lot of other places that we could go, but um, I don't have time to do that this morning. And I want to tell you that the rapture is imminent. And I'll take you out of the first Thessalonians, or excuse me, first Corinthians. First Corinthians 15. The rapture is imminent. That means it could happen at any moment. Paul didn't know if he was going to die before the rapture happened. He said, we who are alive and remain, because he was alive at the time. We who are alive and remain. He said, it could happen in my lifetime. There's no prophetic event that has to take place before the rapture. The rapture of the church is the next event on God's prophetic calendar for the human race. Now, there's some things that need to be set in place, and, the, and they are there now. And, and we'll, we'll get to that in a moment. But the rapture is imminent. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep. We're not all going to die. But we're gonna be, some of us are going to be changed. What's going to happen? Verse 52. In a moment... In the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, there's that trumpet again, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised incorruptible. Did we just read that in 1 Thessalonians? The trumpet's going to sound, the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we will be changed. That fast. <coughs> Excuse me. We're going to be changed. This corruptible must put on incorruption. Thank you for whoever put this water there. And this mortal must put on immortality. Because he said in the earlier verses, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. So when this corruption, corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Praise the Lord. He's coming for us. That's the, the Bible says in, in, in Titus 3, I think it's verse 10, he says, this is the blessed hope of the church. Okay? Now, we're going to go to Revelation. We're going to have to spend a little bit of time in Revelation chapter 1 through 4. This is Bible study, so I hope I'm not giving you too much Bible. Is that possible to get too much Bible at a Bible study? Okay. <clears throat> in Revelation... We have the, the, the backdrop of this thing is that the Apostle John, by the way, was the only apostle of Jesus' original tribe of apostles. John is the only one who did not die a violent death. It wasn't for lack of trying. They boiled him in oil. They did all kinds of things. They finally, because he wouldn't shut up, he kept talking about Jesus and preaching the gospel they, they banished him to the island of Patmos. And the island of Patmos would be like Alcatraz without cells, without, uh, without a prison on it. 
They just dumped all the undesirables on the island of Patmos and said, there, have it at it, and you know, you guys are on your own. So he's on the island of Patmos, verse 10. He says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. What's happening here? The Lord's day is Sunday. I was in the Spirit. What does that mean? He means that he was praising and worshiping God. In the worst of circumstances, here's a guy who's praising and worshiping God. He's in the Spirit on the Lord's day. And I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet. There it is. And the voice said, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. What you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches, which are in Asia, uh, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. And then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and having turned, I saw. And then what he sees is he sees Jesus, a glorified Christ, walking among the candlesticks, representing the churches, the seven candlesticks, the seven churches, having the seven stars in his right hand. And when you go over to um, verse 17, where it starts in the red, and he says, after he describes what he saw, Jesus says, do not be afraid, I'm the first and the last. I'm he who lives and was dead, and behold, I'm alive forevermore, amen. And I have the keys of Hades, or hell, and death. Now, verse 19, you've got to pay attention to this. Write. Okay, John, I'm appeared to you, and here's what I want you to do. I want you to write the things which you have seen. Okay, is there any English majors in here? I expect Robert to get this. I know your, English wasn't your major. You're a history teacher. <laughs> write the things which you have seen. What tense is that past tense write down the things which you have seen what has he seen well what he's seen so far is a glorified jesus walking among the candlesticks holding the seven stars in his right hand that's what he has seen so he wrote that and then the next phrase he says and the things which are now what tense is things which are Present tense. Who said present over here? Who's the smart people? There we go. <laughs> That's present tense. The things that are right now. So what is right now is the church age. The letter to the seven churches is, represents the church age. And at the end of the church age... It, that, that's the end of it. But right now we are in the church age. The things which are... And so if you've read those seven letters to the seven churches, you know that that's, that's what is. Okay? And then he says, write the things which will take place after this. What tense is that? Future tense. Write down the things that are going to happen after the church age. So you get the seven letters to the seven churches, which are very interesting writings. And then you get to the end of chapter 3. And that's the end of the letters to the seven churches. And then chapter 4 starts like this. We're talking about future tense now. After these things, after what things? After the things I saw, and after the things which are, which is the church age. After these things, I looked and behold a door standing open in heaven. What's happening after the church age? Now we're on page two, by the way, if, you're, if you have an outline. This door stands open in heaven. I see it. And the first voice which I heard was like, hey, what? A trumpet. A trumpet speaking with me. And it said, come up here. Harpezo. Okay? This is the type of, this is the, the type of the rapture. This is... Not, not the type. This is the actual rapture happening. Okay? After the church, at the end of the church age, the very next thing after that is a door opens in heaven, a trumpet sounds, and a voice says, come up here. And I will show you things which must take place after this. After what? After the church age. 
After you're all done on earth, here's the things that are going to happen after that. After the church is gone. Verse 2, he says, immediately, in the twinkling of an eye, immediately, I was in the Spirit. Oh, I thought he was already in the Spirit. In chapter 1, verse 10, he says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. Okay? What he's saying here is, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, worshiping God. And when this happened, I was instantly in, a, in the Spirit world. I was in the Spirit, the world of the spirits. He was in heaven. Like that. How do you know he was in heaven? Immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven, and one sat upon the throne. There he is. So, are you getting the division here of the book of Revelation? The things which you have seen, the vision of Christ, the things which are as the church age, and the things which will be hereafter. After the church age, after the rapture happens, some things are going to go on on this planet. When you read Revelation chapter 6 uh, through chapter 19, uh, you will find out that you don't want to be here. You will find out that before you get very far into that uh, process of the seven-year Great Tribulation, half of the people in the world will die. So many people will die in such great numbers, masses in, in, in concentrated places that they won't have enough workers to bury the bodies. And when that happens, you're going to get intense plagues and diseases from all these rotting corpses. And, and it's, it's not going to be a great place to be. So now we're looking at signs of the times. Now we can't really understand where we are now if we don't understand where we are going we are going in the rapture, right? We're going to be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. And Jesus said there's going to be some signs that happen, not before the rapture, but before the great tribulation. These signs we're going to talk about here are, are in reference to the signs of the coming great tribulation. There, there really isn't any sign for the rapture. I don't know if you know that or not. I mean, people, scoffers, things like that, but there, there's no, like, really major world events that go, okay, when you wake up in the morning and you read the news and it says Hotel Marysville burnt last night. Anybody know that? Hotel Marysville burnt last night. So that's your sign. You know, go out there and get on your roof and get ready. No, there, there's no sign for the rapture like that. But he said there are some signs that are going to set up the great tribulation. See, when the church is gone, in 2 Thessalonians, the Bible says that when the church is raptured out of here, that God is going to send a strong delusion that people will, that are left will believe a lie because they didn't love the truth when they had it. We better love the truth. Love Jesus and love the truth. Amen? So here's the signs of the time. The number one sign isn't a, a big blow up of stuff that you could just point to. Here's, here it is. It's something that just creeps in so subtly that it could, it could get, nobody could, nobody's immune to this thing. And it's deception. There, there is so much deception out there. You got, I mean, you got prophets all over the internet now. You got apostles and prophets and you got people declaring this and declaring that. And God told me last night, God showed me a dream, God spoke to me this, that, and the other. And when you put them all together and compare them, none of them even agree. Get on YouTube, New Life 530, go back a, a year or so and find some messages called pastors or podcasts. Pastors, you want to get you want to you want to sit under pastors or you want to sit under all those internet podcasts and people that are just spewing all kinds of stuff. You don't know them. There's no accountability. You don't know what their life is like. Anyway, enough of that. Okay. False teachers, false prophets, false messiahs even. People saying that, that Jesus is here. He's there. Jesus said, don't fall for that stuff. In Romans 16, verse 17, 
It says that there's going to come a time when people are going to bring you doctrines and teachings that are contrary to what you've learned. He said, don't, don't go after them. In Colossians chapter 2, Paul said, as you have learned Christ, so walk in him. I've learned Christ. That's why I probably couldn't fit anywhere else. It's a good thing God let me stay here after I got done being a pastor. <laughs> because I, w- I couldn't fit anywhere else. Because I learned to know Jesus in the spirit of this fellowship. And I've been at it for almost 50 years with Brother Ron over there and Bill and Sue. And I think Jim was here before I got here. You ain't that old. How'd that work? (laughs) Bob, Harold, hey, I learned Jesus a certain way. I, I just wouldn't fit anywhere else. But he says, when they bring you doctrines and teachings that try to turn you away from how you've learned Christ, don't follow them. In 2 Corinthians 11, verses 3 and 4, Paul says, I'm worried about you guys. I've heard that, that some people have come by after I was there, and they're trying to give you a different Jesus and a different spirit and a different gospel. And I'm afraid you might put up with them. Hey, there's, there's all kinds of deception going on out there. In 2 Peter chapter 2, the whole chapter of 2 Peter chapter 2 gives you... Uh, a profile of false teachers and false prophets and how they, they, they don't submit to anybody, they don't have any oversight, they have no accountability, and, and their message can be just about anything. In the book of Jude, right before Revelation, the book of Jude, just one chapter, talks about wells. These false prophets, false teachers, are wells without water. Peter called them in 2 Peter chapter 2, they're clouds without rain. They deceive you. You know what happens when there's a certain time of year, before, before we had automatic sprinklers, at our other house we didn't have automatic sprinklers, we had a sprinkler and a hose and that, and you, you get into that period of, of weather where it's overcast and you don't think about watering the lawn, but it never rains. You can go three, four, or five days a week of overcast skies and no rain. It's deceptive. It lulls you to sleep to thinking that everything's okay and the grass is dying. Why is the grass dying? Well, it hasn't rained. You haven't watered it. False teachers are clouds without rain. They're not going to give you anything that's going to water your soul and bring life to you. Another sign is global unrest. This great tribulation time is preceded or, or what ushers us in is a great global unrest. If you watch anything about Israel right now, Israel is, in, is surrounded. All their countries around them hate them. They're launching rockets at them. They're, they've been at war since October 7th last year. It's just, it, it's, if you read Psalm 83, it talks about the inner circle of countries surrounding Israel going to war with them, and that's what's going on right now. That's prophecy unfolding before our very eyes. And and what are they calling for? Now everybody's pressuring Israel for a ceasefire, right? Even the U.S., we're pressuring them for a ceasefire. Let's go in there. Let's go make peace. Let's let's let the dust settle. Let's go in there and and make peace. Let outside negotiators, they're all wanting a two-state solution. Everybody wants a two-state solution except the Palestinians. They don't want a two-state solution. They had one. And what do they do? They try to annihilate Israel. They don't want a two-state solution. So, but that's what the, the United Nations is, is, is passing resolutions and things that are pressuring Israel to make peace. So what's going to happen is, if that, if that does happen, you, you really better be paying attention. Because what did it say in 1 Thessalonians 5? When they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction will come upon them. When they think that they've got their peace deal all brokered and, it's, and, and that, that the out, people outside of Israel are now controlling this situation, they're going to say, we got the handle on this now. Everything's going to be good. It's not going to be good for very long. During the Great Tribulation, time of war is going to involve the whole world. World War III, literally. You don't want to be here. So I found this yesterday. According to the World Population Review... Right now, there's 39 countries at war. 
39 countries on this globe right now are at war. That's a lot of wars. Okay? Another thing that's going to happen is devastation. Humanity is going to be devastated by famines. We have, more, we have more than enough food in this world to feed everybody. But a few people are going to hoard it, and they're going to control the masses. Anybody, anybody seen the news from Idaho lately? Idaho shut down a half a million acres of farms because they, they, they won't let them water. We're, we are controlling the water, and the government's controlling the water. Same thing in Oregon. In Oregon, a few months ago, they shut down all the small farmers. Why do they, your backyard garden is illegal in Oregon. If you're watering it, it's illegal because they said that water belongs to the government. Even the groundwater belongs to the government. You can't water. So if you're, if you're gardening in Oregon, you're an outlaw. Okay? Now, my personal conspiracy opinion about all that, <laughs> they're, not, they're not shutting down the large, giant farming operations, because those are regulated by the government and they can tell them what to put in the food or where the food can go and can't go. If you want to control a population, you control the food without firing a shot, you've won the battle. In days. In days. It doesn't take years. It doesn't take billions of dollars of military uh, uh, apparatus and boots on the ground and kicking in doors. It doesn't take any of that. All you do is just shut off the food. There's only three days of food on the shelf in any city in our country at any one time. If the trucks stopped right now, everything froze, in three days there will be nothing left in any of the markets in America. Think about that. Devastation, famine, no food, earthquakes. I see this guy on, on, on YouTube, I watch him, he, he's always talking about the rapture. And at the end of his rapture news thing, he says, okay, here's the earthquake report. And every single day on this planet, there's anywhere from 40 to 100 or 150 earthquakes over 4.0. And usually a few over 5.0, and every once in a while there's a big one over 6.0 or bigger. Earthquakes are ramping up. Pestilence. Pestilence is disease. We're not talking about all the dead bodies. It doesn't just come from dead bodies. Pestilence is the spread of tragic, uncontrollable diseases. And because of that, I hadn't seen my brother in four years. I got to see him this week. But because of COVID, an uncontrollable disease it just got unleashed on the planet. I didn't, I, I didn't get to see my brother. I was there on, in March of 2020, and I was planning on coming home. He lives in Nevada. I was planning on coming home on Saturday. And then we saw the weather report, and the, the pass might be snowed in on Saturday. And they start talking about shutting down churches and stopping group gatherings and all this stuff just coming at you at once. And I said, man, i got to get home because I might have to make some executive decisions about the church but I didn't get this because of that. And then they got COVID. We had COVID, blah, blah, blah. All that stuff went around. And I didn't get to see my brother for four years. Hey, that's nothing compared to what's coming. Okay, Revelation 22. Last chapter of the Bible. And I'm going to wind this thing up. I haven't even told you what I wanted to tell you yet. <laughs> Revelation chapter 22. Verse 12. And behold, I am coming quickly. Jesus said, I'm coming quickly. My reward is with me to give everyone according to his work. Verse 17. And the spirit and the bride say, come. Let him who hears say, come. Come. Let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take of the water of life freely. Verse 20. He who testifies of these things says, Surely I am coming quickly. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. 
Now, some people, some people are absolutely obsessed with the rapture. I actually wish more of us were. <laughs> I, I, I hope that that's right there, ever present, all the time. Some Christians are pre completely preoccupied with the rapture. But I, as important as that is, I want to tell you, the rapture is not what Jesus is preoccupied with. Jesus is preoccupied with the harvest. He, the rapture is going to happen whenever it happens, but Jesus is preoccupied with the harvest. Yeah, we want to, we want to be with Jesus. I want, to, I want to get out of this stinking flesh. I want to get out of this stinking world and get with Jesus in the presence, in the physical presence of the Lord. I want to be melted by the light of his love. It'll just melt you. Glory to God. But right now, there's work to do. There's work to do. Jesus said, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. That's what he's about. John 4, 35. Jesus is talking to his disciples. He said, you guys are saying there's four months to the harvest. And he says, no, I'm telling you, look, lift up your head. Look at the fields. They are already white to harvest. Jesus said the harvest is ripe, but the laborers are few. Pray the Lord of the harvest that he will raise up laborers, workers to go into his harvest field. In Mark 16, verse 20, it says, they went out preaching everywhere and the Lord worked with them. That's what he's preoccupied with. It's nice to think about the rapture. It's nice to realize that at any moment we can be out of here. We need to live rapture ready. They went preaching everywhere. The Lord worked with them. In Acts 8, verse 4, persecution happened in Jerusalem. It says everybody except the apostles fled, ran from the city, going who knows where. They're refugees. They are refugees. They have nothing. And what do they do? It says they went everywhere preaching the word. That's what Jesus is preoccupied with. It's getting the lost. Situational awareness for a Christian is to live rapture ready, to know that at any second, things can change. That's what it means to be situational awareness, to be aware of your surroundings and know that at any moment, this can change. I mean, I, I was thinking about that the other day. I went out to, to, to the barn and I looked at the cows and stuff and I went... These are going to be somebody else's. <laughs> everything here, my home, everything in it is just going to be handed over to somebody else. The thugs and the looters and the people that are trying to escape the devastation, probably. But anyway, situational and awareness, living rapture ready, knowing that this can change in a second. And another situational awareness is Everybody that you encounter needs Jesus. Everybody that you encounter is a living, everlasting soul. And they're going to live forever in heaven, or they're going to live forever in eternal damnation, torment, where the fire never goes out and the worm doesn't die. So, Jonathan Trailer, I, I, I had the song in my head, but I didn't know who sings it. This guy has a song called The King is Coming. And I think part of the chorus is, while we're waiting, we'll be working. Amen? While we're waiting, we're going to be working. I, w I went to, into my truck the other day to get some tracks to give to somebody, and I didn't, I'm, I'm out of tracks. I said, i got to reload. On your way out of church today, grab some of them tracks back there. On the, on the wall, there's a little holder that's got gospel track messages get a few of those you never know when you're going to come across somebody and you're going to say hey you know what read this when you have a spare time you look on the back we've got a, a youtube channel where you can hear us preach you got uh, facebook and and here's our church address and service times come and visit us you know get get the door open amen